So the first talk um, will be by Chris Duffy. Uh, he'll be talking about CZOs, big data, and team science. Good morning, and I uh, really appreciate the chance to come and talk a little bit about uh, this issue that's been uh, discussed for the last 30 minutes. Uh, um, I, I kind of guessed at what the topic might be, and I think I hit it pretty close to the head with, from the introductory words here. So I'm going to talk about critical zone observatories, a little bit about some of the work uh, we've been doing, but try to relate it to maybe the theme of uh, that uh, is, is seems to be the focus of this meeting. I want to talk about big data and team science and the sort of poor state, I would say, of the access we have to the geospatial, geotemporal data we need to put models in place in real environments. Rather than, I, I've done a lot of toy models over my career, and uh, you know they're very good for sort of beginning the understanding part of it. But in the end, we need to do this on real terrain and real, real uh, domains. So I want to point out that you know we have two, uh, actually three. Soil Trek is the European version of the CZOs. We have CSDMS. We have the CZOs, uh, we have uh, Quasi, we have a tremendous r community resource that are start, I think are beginning to merge in some of their ideas. So let's see if uh, this, we can capture some of that here. Uh, CZO actually are test beds and can be uh, international, global test beds for uh, team science based approach to water and ecosystem services and for geochemistry, for landscape evolution. I'm going to stick to the wa water side, which is close to my, my own work. Uh, we have many motivators. We have uh, all of these sort of social issues from energy to ecosystem services, floods, droughts. Uh, so we really know the importance of, of, of why these models are important, not just for science, but for the social uh, it's, it's in the community uh, good and well-being. Uh, I'll make a, a pitch. I just came back from uh, a week-long meeting in the joint, at the Joint Research Center in Ispra, Italy. Got here at 3 in the morning uh, from there. And so it was a, a bit of a challenge with that, thunder, or that uh, snowstorm. But uh, the critical zone observatories are a huge uh, part of where uh, this is going. And this there's a whole bunch of critical zone observatories in France now. And these are, this is an ad hoc group at this point. There's really not an organizing structure yet, but they're popping up all over the world. And uh, these can become test beds for where we do a lot of our earth science work. Some of the issues that I see that links big data to big simulations, uh, scaling up critical zone or other observatory simulations and data uh, as a framework for earth casting. I mean, basically we do our experiments at local scales, we develop our models at relatively local scales, but they should apply to larger scales, or that should be the motivation. Uh, one of the things that we've been talking about are, are these, as what we might call essential terrestrial variables. Uh, these are national or global products where things like the soil survey, the national hydrogeologic databases, uh, the, uh, uh, the climate reanalysis, the uh, vegetation coverage in global, nationally and globally. The accessibility of these things is pretty tough because they're all on different format. They're not available easily for scientists to begin to do uh, their studies everywhere, and I want to talk a bit about that. Uh, so, one of the things we need to do is to virtualize the access uh, to data and models and do it in a way where we can scale the data, scale the models, begin the process of replacing bad data. If I say that, uh, many of you will say, well, s much of the international national data might be poor. Uh, Yes, because we don't have a process in place that can begin the versioning process. Basically, it's a one-off thing. Uh, and nobody uh, 
has the capability at this point to begin to do that long-term maintenance of data uh, across agencies. Now, I, I must say that we have agencies that are doing a fantastic job of making data available. But at the same time, there are many agencies, and, and all the agencies have different ways of, 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 of presenting their data or different styles of how we access it, and it makes it very difficult to do science, the kind of science that we're talking about. Uh, Reanalysis is a very nice example of the evolution of uh, a, a th the experimental theoretical basis. In other words, early on there were climate, global climate models that weren't very good. Uh, maybe you'll argue that they're not very good still, but they're much better than they used to be because they've coordinated international data and improved on that record over time. And uh, now it's a much denser grid. They're all, we're talking about very high resolution database, how things like NEON and CZOs and GLEON and some of the other observatory initiatives can begin to feed into that uh, data to begin so we can reanalyze historical records in the context of the current modeling. Uh, and of course, the practical side is we need a platform for communicating science and science-based decision making. Okay, so uh, I ten, tend to use the watershed as a, as a basis. There's many other ways we could look at this, but let's, let's uh, take this track at least for this point, from at this point. The watershed as a basis for model data sharing. There are 103,000 uh, USGS HUC-12 watersheds, uh, 2,200 HUC-8 watersheds. This is one way to, to partition and tile the data, and it would be very valuable for many scientists. Uh, the one thing that we have to keep in mind is the spatial and temporal scales of this kind of data. Uh, I put in here the sort of the critical zone scales where they're going from plots and hill slopes up to small watersheds and try to link it with some of the other scales of motion that we know we'll need. And so you can see that the scale at which we do a lot of our earth science work is right here. It's in the center of, of these, this, uh, the global scale, the atmospheric science from uh, mesoscale on up to synoptic. Um, and so it's a critical, we, we, we are in a critical gap, and it's a gap that's missing in the climate models. The climate models do not resolve first, second, and third order streams. There's one topographic point every 50 or 100 kilometers. So the, we know they're missing a big part of the signal, let's say. And this is where these CZO or other kinds of test beds could make a huge difference. What are the essential terrestrial variables? This is a evolving list. This is the list we use for water uh, and hydrologic part uh, modeling. We have the National Soil Survey. We have the USGS groundwater land cover data from USGS and EPA and uh, land use. Uh, environmental tracers is something new that the uh, uh, atmospheric scientists are simulating, oxygen 18 deuterium and rainfall. Uh, and then there's a whole bunch of missing stuff on infrastructure. There's very few watersheds that are pristine these days. And uh, we don't often even think about all the interactions with highways, bridges, roads, and, and structures. The problem is that there's hundreds of terabytes of data and it sits in many places. We need, as scientists, but then I think in, in terms of society as well, a way to harmonize that data so we can have and have access to it from our own uh, specialties. Uh, one of the things that that does is it projects the data in the same, uh, has, has the data in the same projection. We use a geodatabase idea to do that, but there, there's other ways one can do that. So registering geospatial and geotemporal fields, access to the essential terrestrial variables that we need to do earth science, and automate the workflows from getting data to models and back and forth. This is how the versioning process can begin as well. And uh, so these are, these are kind of critical things in my mind. Uh, I, I'll give the example of our Penn State model. This is an unstructured grid. Uh, I'll give just a few examples so you can get an idea of, of how uh, these, the ETVs and some of these ideas come into play. Uh, but this is quite general. We use a, an older version of the community land model, NOAA, in this model. Uh, and, and now we are working with uh, folks like Sue Brantley and Lily who are 
uh, building uh, geochemical uh, algorithms. Rudy's working with uh, students to build landscape evolution with uh, hydrology as part of that. Okay, so we have this uh, database called HydroTerror. Um, it is a prototype for model data access. The kinds of things we've registered in this, it's about 200 terabytes of data so far. Uh, has land parcel data for some parts of the North America, stream, lake, huck 12s USDA soils, crop, national land cover database, etc. And these are all registered. Um, I don't think I have time, but we can go to that site and, uh, and bring up uh, a huck 12 click on a huck 12 and download all that geospatial data in about a minute. And, that's, and that would give you climate reanalysis data, hourly data for 30 years. Uh, the, uh, this is the soils map. Uh, you'll see also here the National Wetland Inventory, USGS uh, stream uh, information. There's some more reservoirs that's in the wetlands. Uh, and the, re the colored is the soil survey. The Sergo Soil Survey has 300 million polygons of soils information that geologists should be interested in. Uh, we also, uh, Zhuan Yu has been working with this uh, simple model Google chart that allows you to, this is something we do with our, our Penn State model, is we take a, a rainfall record. This is, a cal this is for a, a, a watershed in Pennsylvania where this is the predicted and observed and predicted uh, runoff. This is soil moisture groundwater level, recharge, of evapotranspiration. So the idea is to have a reanalysis product of, of your observatory, of your site, where you've made the best you can do with this time, simulation of the water budget, and you put this out and uh, let other scientists shoot at it. it that's, it's never going to be good the first time but it has to be an evolutionary process. We're working with the Europeans uh, at the Dama Glacier with uh, Stefano Bernasconi and Maria Andrinaki and uh, Juan Yu is a fellow at Penn State that's been working closely with them to look at how do glaciers uh, and hydrology interact. And so we've, we're working on an algorithm, a new uh, routine that will actually have ice as well as the snow routines that we have in there now. Okay, so this is just the, the, the foot of the glacier. This is one of those glaciers that's going away and going away fast. And this, right along this transect here is where there's a, this chrono sequence of soils. And the chrono sequence gives this sort of a very nice, this is the soils that were gel, uh, generated just in the last seven years, 72, 120, and, and 10,000. It's a very interesting uh, study. I won't talk more about this, just to, just to give you an idea of the of the kinds of things that, that uh, people are doing. Um, this is a uh, the modeling area that we're going to do, uh, we're in the process of doing with the, uh, they're taking the lead. So this is definitely a community approach. Stefano's group is taking the lead. We're also working on Crete with uh, Nikos Nikolaitis to look at the White Mountains, the uh, 2,000 meter mountains on 2,500 meter mountains on uh, Crete. This is the geologic picture a little bit, and here's some of the team uh, that are developing. It's a karst uh, system, um, and that, that model is, is underway as well. Uh, I'll give you a little more detail about Shale Hills. Uh, Shale Hills is this small 20 hectare watershed uh, on uh, shale, uh, the Rose Hill Shale, with very low permeability for the most part, and then soils have developed on the surface. And uh, we have been fortunate enough to get some of the NCOM LIDAR for this site. All the CZOs have this now. So we're developing in high resolution soil survey, uh, depth to bedrock, uh, high resolution land cover uh, is available for these sites. With this new test bed information, we can do very high resolution to begin to see how uh, resolution factors into uh, forecasting. And, and simulation. Uh, we've developed a Shale Hill storm library to look at the last 30 years of uh, tropical storms that come through the region and what they do. They come at the end of the summer drought. Turns out they're very critical for resupplying water resources, uh, the soil moisture and groundwater and stream flow. And this is just a, if you probably can't read these, but these are certain tropical storms, barrel, 
Allison, uh, Hugo was in there somewhere. This is the 30 year record and uh, the runoff from that site. So the idea is this is a resource now for people to do climate studies and sort of recover from the summer drought or not. And in fact, if we don't get a, a heavy tropical storm in the fall at the uh, Shale Hill CZO, uh, that drought goes all the way through the winter and, and may persist into the next year. Another thing we've been doing is water with water isotopes. Uh, oxygen 18 deuterium network, and this, these are some of the data points. We, we try to sample all components of the water cycle in terms of its oxygen 18 deuterium, and we measure the precipitation at six hourly intervals during storms. And then this is sort of the results of the various pools. We have in the last four years generated more than 6,000 samples. Uh, basically the soil moisture, the groundwater, tree xylem water, the local meteoric water line, the stream, and the inter some interesting things have come out of that. Um, we we uh, also, uh, this is a little bit out of order here, this is just the calibrated uh, runoff. It's an ephemeral stream, and so we have to predict the no-flow periods as well as the flow periods, and sometimes it's, it's kind of hard to get the peaks, but we're trying to build calibration tools that uh, create this water background for all components of the water budget. The evapotranspiration, groundwater levels, and runoff are some of those calibration tools. Well, we're also uh, simulating oxygen 18 deuterium uh, compositions, and this is, the blue is the rainfall, the red is the observed, and the black is the simulated uh, so far, you might say it's not that great. It's a it's kind of a first cut. It was Gopal Bhatt's dissertation just recently. But what we then can do is to uh, s simulate the average age. And so the ocean guys have figured out that you can turn concentration or uh, something like uh, isotopes of water into age as a simulation tool. And this is the average age of patches from a, this distributed database across the watershed and you can see that the age, uh, it's a dynamic thing, it's not constant. This idea of a steady state age is, just doesn't seem to be a reasonable thing from what we're finding. And so you get, you get an idea that there's a lot of spatial variability due to what? Due to soil structure, due to recharge, due to vegetation, due to topography, all of those factors. Um, and so reanalysis then can also be applied because now the part of reanalysis is simulating oxygen 18 deuterium in rainfall. And it, it's happening at a, uh, about a 50 kilometer grid of the group in Japan that we work with. And so we can simulate age through time. How fast is this? What is the residence time of water? And what you see here is sort of a moving average and the seasonal variations in the age of water. The age gets, during the summer drought, it, the age increases because the, the hydrology slows down and then speeds up in the winter spring when the, the cycle is working faster. So there's a real dynamics to that. I'll, I'll skip through this. This is just another soil, soils map uh, of the area surrounding our Shale Hill site where we're scaling up. This is around 200 square kilometers, a little less, uh, where we're trying to use the detailed information we have at this scale with the LIDAR we, coverage we have now to, be guilt, to build new scales of modelings uh, at Shale Hills. This was a grid in, within that domain where we we're simulating wetlands. And uh, from PIM, we, we can adaptively uh, resolve the wetlands. And sometimes we don't know where they are, so we don't resolve them. But we're still able to predict the wetlands. We actually ran the model to predict where wetlands were, and it, it worked very well. So uh, IPC forcing is another thing that can be done. I don't want to go through the details, but the idea here is that once you have the historical reanalysis, it makes sense to begin to think about projecting into the future under different climate regimes, under soil regimes, and what will be uh, these uh, trajectories, let's say, of things like uh, what's the impact of a two degree temperature change uh, on, on the precipitation, on the uh, historical recharge, uh, on evapotranspiration, and there looks like there's pretty severe uh, impacts. I'll skip that one. 
Okay, uh, this, I just want to make, make the final point about this atmospheric modeling of stable isotopes and precipitation. This is Kei Yoshimura at the University of Tokyo's work where he's downscaling oxygen 18 deuterium as a very useful tracer in hydrologic systems. And what we're finding is that, and this is just some of the, the, cor the coarse scale results and the very fine scale results for the mid-Atlantic region for oxygen 18. Uh, and so uh, you might say, well, we, it's a model result. Is it any good? Well, we're comparing it with our CZO and with the Purdue Isoscape uh, site, and uh, it's not too bad. I mean, it depends what you're trying to get out of it, but it certainly captures seasonality very nicely. So this is deuterium. This is oxygen 18 for a period of several years here, yeah. So 07 to 12. So uh, we've made, so this is another reason why test beds can be really important to begin to test m the value of models for new kinds of observations or new kinds of, of model results. Okay, so it, where the application here is the Chesapeake Bay and how the Chesapeake, this, this could, could begin to address a very important question that the Chesapeake Bay people have. Where's the nitrate and does it, what is its residence time? How quickly does it take to move through the system? And can we come up with a predictive tool that will help us with the several thousands of these Huck-12s, uh, where is the scale of, the, that's what the, this is, is showing here, uh, where the water is and how do we best manage uh, nitrate uh, loading into the bay along with sediments and other things. Okay, so uh, I, I made my case that test beds and models and data have to kind of evolve together and we can't do this one-off approach anymore. I think we've hit a limit here. We need to be developing the data that supports the models hand in hand with the models. There's a lot of technical challenges and technical difficulties to, to try to get over, but it seems to me that's a, a challenge worth taking. Just to review some, some of the issues, probably a multi-model framework, I'm not probably, I'm certain a multi-model framework is the way to move forward. For, uh, for earth casting in general. Uh, we need to agree to develop what these essential terrestrial variables are that are critical to your science and make sure that they're accessible to your whole community, not just individuals. It, it's important that we find ways to share that information. Uh, there needs to be a new cyber infrastructure for that, and I can, uh, we have a prototype idea for that that we, we are happy to share. I didn't go into that, but, but certainly uh, we need uh, some new tools and, and capabilities there. Uh, Reanalysis, this could be very general. Think of it as reconstruction. Historical re-simulation and, and assimilation of historical data and no place is better to do it than at environmental observatories where we're going to have and do have very rich data sets. Um, a platform for communicating science and science-based decision making, making will be the ultimate result here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for the presentation. I think it was, um, it's really pointing in, in the right direction. I would like to make one comment to the points you have up there and then one question. You mentioned the, ter the essential terrestrial variables. Um, you're probably aware of the essential climate variables under the yeah. United Nations Framework Convention of Climate Change. We are discussing now essential biodiversity variables in the Di Biodiversity Convention, and the group on Earth observations is discussing water, health, uh, energy, agriculture, biodiversity, and all of these essential variables. And I think it would be very important to integrate this, not as a national product, but really as an international convention on what are the essential variables. Yeah, and quick comment on that before the question because I, I failed to mention that this is directly from the WMO's essential climate variables. They have subgroups of essential climate variables. We have taken the essential terrestrial variables, but I think it, you're right. It has to be a global, global issue, and, and this harmonization is no small issue. How do we find data that we can use and do this kind of stuff globally it will be the, the real challenge.
because it also has then a feedback on, on the global Earth observation systems because these need to be observed and so it's very important that we have a very strong support for these essential variables. My, my, where I would like to hear your opinion is um, related to your cyber infrastructure for virtual data and models. I think that's a very uh, important topic. And since this is a meeting here where we are looking into the future a little bit, um, I, th I would like to look in the past first before I ask my question. Uh, 10 years ago, we couldn't really Google something. We had to Yahoo it because there was no uh, real Google at that time. And social networks developed mainly in pubs at that time and not in the internet. And I, I compare what we are doing with the model a little bit where we were 10, 15 years ago with, with uh, documents, information access, um, social networks. And my question is when we look 20, 10 years in the future, we will be in a very, very different situation from today. Are we developing really the concepts that we need to be prepared for the development that would really make a transition from having a few models that can talk to each other to all models talking to each other. You're probably aware of the Internet of Things that are being discussed and by, by 2020 we assume that 50 billion things are talking to us without even us knowing, without knowing it. And my question is whether we can actually think about it on an Internet of models. What would it need to go in the direction where any model could talk to any model um, and so we could really get kind of a uh, communication between models that's not constrained to a few sub subsets of models. I mean that it, that's probably where we're going. I mean, no no question. My sort of narrow take on that is that the first step for us, as in the earth sciences, is to begin to make the connection to the data we have and the models we have, and that way we we'll, we're going to uh, find the a, a way to move the models further. And, for forward, instead of sort of the strategy so far has been very much a one-off proposition. And so, yeah, if there could be an internet of models, I think it should also have an internet of data, uh, global data, and, and, you, and you know the challenges there. Uh, many countries don't share their data. They sell it, and they sell it at a premium. Uh, we need to find ways to break down the barriers to something as essential as government-derived data. The U.S. does a good job of that. Uh, U the U.S. Geological Survey in particular are leaders in this area, and they're the first ones that would like to do an internet of data, uh, I, th I think. And now the problem really is, is talking across agencies and trying to find a, f a federated approach that would work. Uh, for the future. But, you know, that's a, I think the internet of models, the internet of data will be, it'll, it'll be transparent and opaque, or excuse me, it'll be opaque to most of you. You don't need to know how to handle GRIB files. What you want is the climate data. And you want it in a way that, uh, that basically can serve your purposes. And so the, the, the internet of data maybe can, can begin to do that. And, and I think the tools are there but it, it's going to take the community to sort of force the issue. I'm really enthusiastic about the integrated modeling capabilities of CSTMS, especially with some of the new tools and the the standardized naming conventions and so forth that we've seen today, and I've, I've also been following over the last little while. So I'm wondering, from your perspective, as somebody who's doing a lot of modeling and a lot of different interesting projects, wh where do you see that um, you're going to get some, some big bang for your buck by integrating with CSDMS, or has that happened yet, or do you think that might happen down the road? Well, um, I'm, since I'll be chairing this CZO focus group, I would like to think that maybe there'll be some these test bed idea, benchmarking test beds, uh, where we're going to be collecting high resolution data and, and thinking about then how that data scales up. So I think there's a lot of possibilities here. And it's not just CZOs. There are many other kinds of observatories, the Global Lakes Ecological Observing Network, NEON. Uh, you know, so I think there are, and there are many others. Uh, the USGA, or USDA has many uh, watersheds across North America. This uh, international CZOs beginning at, the, at this scale to use them as benchmarks and helping force or push data collection that will serve the needs of 
our f different kinds of earth casting, you might say, uh, will be the, the future. So how, it, it's really not me. I would just say it's, it's a, this has got to be a community thing, but, but I think that uh, CSDMS and Quasi will be really continue to be leaders to help make this happen. In the interest